Hello all, I'm Anubha Anushri. I'm an advanced graduate student at the Department of History, Stanford University. I'm also an assistant professor at the Department of English, University of Delhi. And I'm really delighted and happy to be presenting my paper entitled Between the Brahmins and the Baptists, a history of Kesi script in 19th century India at this very topical forum, Scripts in Asia, circa 1500 to 2080. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I would like to add a caveat that this is a very brief paper that just outlines some of the themes that I would be happy to elaborate upon during the Q&A. Uh, so let me, without much ado, turn to my paper. And uh, this paper focuses uh, on one of the texts that was written on Kaiti script in late 19th century called Patra Hiteshni. In his introduction to the volume on Kaiti alphabets, Ambika Prashad, a high school Kaista teacher, highlighted the two most crucial aspects of Kaiti script. One, that it could be easily accessed by people in the villages, so you did not require much literacy to read the script. And secondly, it was uniquely positioned to capture words from different uh, languages such as Sanskrit and Persian. This paper is an attempt to trace the long durée history of Kesi script, and to, uh, it argues that it was Kesi's portability, its ability to move across different regions, and its flexibility, uh, visa, namely its capacity to represent various languages with ease, that eventually caused the decline and extinction of the script. This is a sample of the Kesi script. Recognizing the severe dearth of scholarship on Kesi, this paper calls to attention the more recent story of Kesi, uh, Kesi's encounter with technocratic and nationalistic ideologies of orthographic hygiene. The seemingly microscopic story of Kesi's dramatic extinction in late 19th century India also highlights the larger convergences between colonial technologies and nationalist ideologies. Nationalism emerged precisely by appropriating forms of technologies such as printing uh, that promoted its universalizing tendencies. This study thus charts the emergence of Kesi, its popularity and integration into various popular as well as administrative forms, and then concludes with its eventual decline in the 19th century. It is now well known that Kesi was popular across a wide geography in the Indian sub subcontinent from Assam in the east to Gujarat in the west. And although the script was predominantly used uh, by the medieval and early modern scribes, clerks, accountants, uh, there is now evidence that uh, quasi-historical um, and mystical scripts existed, mystical texts uh, used Kesi. Uh, it is believed that uh, Kesi was predominant in these regions, Bihar, Bengal, Assam, uh, and there's a district in particular uh, called Kamru, where there's evidence of usage of Kethi in mystical, uh, in mystical texts, esoteric and mystical texts. Uh, Indian languages have widely prescribed to various orthographic representations. And what was perhaps distinctive about Kethi was its adaptability to various patterns of writing practices and sound systems. It must also be noted that the use of Kesi in different regions and cultures did not remain consistent. In the far eastern regions of India, what today are Assam, Nepal, and Tibet, Kesi was appropriated in quasi-religious and mystical cultures, even as it found acceptance in written narrations of popular legends. So these are some of the examples from Nepal and Assam. Uh, Kethi was also used in Northern India in administrative documents. So there are examples of Mughal, Sanads, and Seals, which use Kethi uh, from early modern time period. And these are some of the samples of the usage of Kethi in Mughal Seals. Uh, but we now turn to the 19th century story of Kethi. In describing the importance of print and language to the emergence of nationalism, several scholars have placed a great deal of emphasis on the circulation of print as socially constitutive and transformative. The role of scripts and forms of scriptural associations have remained widely understudied, however, in the case of South Asia. Uh, to be sure, South Asian nationalism was crucially bolstered by its identification with 
two predominant languages, Hindi and Urdu. However, to argue the history of script, also as the history of language is particularly troublesome because it assumes that every language is monoscriptural uh, following the models of Euro European languages. And uh, secondly, it's also problematic because it is assumed that scripts are very transparent and stable mechanisms of communicating content. Even as such assumptions may have been rendered true in modern languages, North Indian languages were scripturally porous. Hindustani or Hindui as it was called, was a crucible of scripts that coalesced around Dev Nagari only by the beginning of the 18th century. By 19th century, Kethi continued to be utilized by many languages of Bengal, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh. You can see the slide where Kethi is used to write different scripts, uh, different languages. The osmotic scriptural ecology of this region was vastly transformed with the onset of missionary printing. Baptist missionaries actively active in the region around 18th century were the first to develop metal fonts of Kathy once the script was standardized and approved by the company, the East India Company in 1837. Uh, and this is the introduction of uh, Kathy uh, by the Baptist Missionary Press. And uh, it is called as a very convenient script because it is, it can, uh, it is, uh, it is supposedly written in a dragging style and it is without a head stroke. Uh, the Calcutta Bible Society, the single most important religious publication houses of the subcontinent in the century, also started printing Kathy theological works. And one of its first publications in Kathy was the book of Genesis and part of Exodus in 1851. The missionaries rendered Kathy similar to Dave Nagri, uh, adding headstroke as well as vowel symbols. And such gestures also triggered instant comparisons between Kathy and other uh, scripts such as Bengali and Dave Nagari. Uh, and it became increasingly clear that Kathy was uh, what is called as a ghasita or dragging uh, style. And uh, that was not necessarily a very efficient system of writing. Um, Kethi's regulation and standardization by missionary printing had two crucial impacts. One, compelled by the intellectual affinities to India's Brahmanic Sanskritic and therefore Devnagari script traditions, missionaries attempted to make Kethi similar to Devnagari, inadvertently sanctifying Devnagari as the most representative script of Hindustani. The second crucial change that missionary printing of Kethi effected was to make the script more accessible. With the expansion in missionary publication, there was a parallel emergence of what is called Zenana or female readership. Um, nevertheless, consistency and efficiency of script characters were two key features of British printing technology over a largely handwritten culture. Many upper caste Indians also adopted these arguments about the scripts. Ambika Prashad's Patra Hiteshni, literally, if you have to translate Patra Hiteshni, uh, you can translate it as female companion or friend of letter writers or letter writing, which was published in 1883, is a reflection of this internalization. Complaining about the difficult handwriting of most practitioners of Kesi, Prashad extols the attempts made by J.C. Nesfield to reform Kesi. According to Prashad, Nesfield's achievements were the division of Kasi alphabets into vowels and conjunctions, as well as the removal of certain infrequently used alphabets. To be sure, Nesfield was not the first British officer to indulge in this orthographic sanitization. Ralph Griffith, back in 1858, had advocated replacing Kasi with Nagari because Kasi was illegible. A senior sub-inspector of schools, A. Thompson, called Kathy a barbarous system of writing. Nevertheless, what is interesting to note in Abhika Prashad's preface is his, is his emphasis he places on popularity of a script as, a manda as mandatory for its continued existence, a question that his predecessors had never paid attention to. In fact, the very title of the work attests to the broader British utilitarian logic of printing in local languages, languages and scripts need to be useful and legible. Legibility of characters was a critical component for the smooth functioning of the colonial state. As T.B. Khan, a British officer of Northwestern province reported in 1862, 
the legibility of Kethi script revealed the pedantic and scheming character of native Patwaris and Kanungos, the Indian officers who were in charge of land assessment. That handwritings reflect the character of person and that Kesi was doomed because of its illegibility or its inherent Kasita character, uh, that was a view that was premised on the belief that scripts should be a transparent conduit to conveying information. That's another example of Kasita Kethi. Such a view of scripts and human character found quick resonance and approval in upper caste and upper class Indians. Bharti Hindu Harishchandra, considered as the founding figure of modern Hindi literature, testified to Hunter Commission in 1882, how Persian and Persianized languages such as Urdu obscured legal communication because of the highly prolix Ghasita script uh, lower court officials deployed. It was to this cumulative charge of Kesi as unintelligible and messy that people like Ambika Prashad seemed to be responding to. Prashad accepted the baptistic and Brahmanical equivocation between legibility and popularity as if a script needed only to be legible to be popular. Prashad's work advocated a pedagogy, an epistolary pedagogy that in itself was indicative of his desire to nurture Kesi letter writing as a craft in the face of an increasing proliferation in local news agencies and printing. Most of the chapters address difficulties of making Kasi more amenable to Hindi vocabulary, adding vowel marks and sanitizing alphabets that the expanded readership of Kasi letter writing now would include. Elaborating in writing on writing in straight hand that imitates the printed letter forms Ambika Prashad emphasized the importance of consistency in the length of Kesi characters, uh, as well as stressed minimizing what he called as Banavot and Sajavot, namely the decoration uh, for the letter to communicate su successfully. At the same time, Patra Hiteshni did not entirely succumb to the governmental and local hostility towards Kesi. The challenge for writers such as Prasad was to nurture a kind of legitimacy for the script that was not premised on exclusivity, but rather coexistence. If languages could coexist, so could scripts. That is uh, something that Prasad seems to be advocating. The advantage of scripts such as Kesi claimed, Ambika Prasad claimed, lied in its ability to present different languages and different sound systems. However, for Ambika Prashad, scripts could coexist by demarcating separate spheres of uh, function. And this is an example of Kathy being used for uh, writing different languages, um, sanitized Kathy being used to write different languages. And uh, the putative focus of Patri Teshni does is not in the polemical and polarized subjectivity of male literacy. Prashad turns towards the upper caste female reader, a niche community of readership that he believes could sustain the scripts through private correspondence. In doing so, he anticipates the coming of age of female epistolary self-fashioning that was increasingly recognized as crucial to anti-colonial and nationalistic pedagogy. It is arguable whether the feminization of Kathy ensured its long life or signaled its decline, but one could say that the redaction of the script from the colonial public sphere also marks the ascendance of technological notions of scripts as functional to content. McDonald's dramatic decision of banning Kathy from schools and courts in 1902 was premised on the questionable belief that Nagari was more consistent and transparent, historical and popular. Triangulated between the British, the Hindus, and the Muslims, the latter half of 19th century was a narrative of decline for a script that transcended Brahmanical proscriptions on literacy, as well as forms of British technological patronage that promoted notions of linguistic purity as expertise. Kesi may have lost the contentions on efficiency and legibility to universalizing tendencies of nationalism and imperial utilitarianism, However, Kathy also remains a strong testimony to that specific historical moment where politics was not entirely based on false divisions and polarities. Indeed, as Ambika Prashad concludes, if humankind continues to be guided by anger and factionalism, then there is no difference between them and the lowliest of animals. And that is my conclusion. I hope to 
uh, have a more uh, rich discussion with you during the Q&A.